Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Technology Philosophy. Today I'm going to talk about French philosopher Jacques Ranciere and his essay from 2002 called The Aesthetic Revolution. A central claim in The Aesthetic Revolution is that each scenario of life autonomy interaction produces its own politics of aesthetics. My method is to describe the four scenarios presented in the essay, highlighting the elements related to the politics of aesthetics in each and critically examine the claim. The first scenario, 1A, is derived from Schiller's originary scene of aesthetics, where initially autonomy is meant not as a property of the object, the artwork, but as an experience of the subject, the spectator. The subject's experience of autonomy is not one of reason subduing sensation, but a specific suspension of that power. Heteronomy, also a property of the experience, not the artwork, is the suspension of the autonomy of reason. Relinquishing power and hierarchy is a key idea in Ranciere, inspired by Schiller's play drive, Spieltrieb, where man is only free when he plays, suspending the opposition between active and passive activity. The artwork and the spectator meet in the sensorium of autonomy where oppositions of activity and passivity are canceled. However, in the artwork's separateness from the spectator, the possession of the new world it promises is unavailable. The artwork participates in the sensorium of autonomy in as much as it is not a work of art. Art that is more than art is the free appearance of a work that is self-contained and appears not to have been intentionally constructed, like the Greek statue Juno Ludovici. The next position, 1b, is moving from art to life, claiming that the free appearance of the statue, not aiming at art, is the appearance of a form of life in which art is not art. Self-containment continues to be the key feature of this form of life and means the self-sufficiency of a collective life like the Greek ideal of life without separation of art, life, and politics. The autonomy-heteronomy relation shifts from one of unavailability to now the autonomy of a life in which art and life are not separate. Art is self-expressions of life. The experience of an artwork is no longer an encounter of a hetero heterogeneity, a suspension of the oppositions of form and matter and activity and passivity, but a product of the human mind that transforms the world into its own sensorium. The consequences of the appearance of this autonomous form of life are now explored in life autonomy interactions. The art becoming life scenario, too, articulates aesthetics connection to politics. Art is not only an expression of life, but a form of its self-education which leads to the formation of a new sensorium and collective ethos. The aesthetic revolution is already present in, 1990, in 1790s German idealism, where the basis for a new idea of revolution is aesthetic education making ideas sensible by turning them into living images. The power of living thought becomes the living power of the community that can successfully oppose the state, thus aesthetic revolution. This is also evident in Marx, where politics is overturned by the aesthetic revolution becoming a human revolution. The human abode is reframed to collective magnificence without hierarchical structure. Art's role is central in the aesthetic revolution's interplay between the new sensibility, aesthetics, and political emancipation. The new life needs a new art where both industrial production and artistic creation is engaged in making a sensorium not just objects. Summarizing the art becoming life scenario, a politics is produced by the subject's self-education through aesthetic experience in which a sensorium develops for the individual to call for a new life and constitute a new collective world. In the next scenario, life becoming art or the life of art, three, Ranciere finds opposition to the aesthetic revolution in Hegel's end of art and spirit of forms. The spirit of forms is problematic because it relocates the important properties of the aesthetic experience, including politics, to the artwork itself. Thus, art is de-aestheticized and the heterogeneous sensible, 
the identity of art and non-art, is threatened. There are two ways to save it, framed as entropies. The first way, 3A, is through the multi-temporality of romantic poetics that blurs art-life boundaries. Romantic poetics takes artworks as metaphoric elements that can be reread into new formulations. This is how common objects may enter the artistic realm. Balzac's curiosity shop in La Peau de Chagrin demonstrates those metamorphoses as the shop's mix of objects and ages creates a new sensorium, a place of exchange between everyday life and art. Therefore, the politics of romantic poetics is a hermeneutics where prosaic objects require historical decoding. The poet becomes naturalist, archeologist, and symptomatologist, delving into a society's unconscious to decipher the politics hidden in everyday life. Romantic poetics overcome the end of art because any object can populate aesthetic experience and the heterogeneous sensible. However, the danger is that everything becomes artistic and nothing escapes infinite reduplication in the domain of art. This prompts the second and opposite way, 3B, to save the heterogeneous sensible by even more strongly demarcating the classic avant-gardist separation of art and life in its emancipatory vision. The autonomy of avant-garde art must stress its underlying heteronomy, which is a tension between two heteronomies, 3bi. The double heteronomy is the coexistence of Apollonian Dionysian plots. In the Apollonian plot, consciousness, logos, weaves the experience of the artwork through itself and the material. In the Dionysian plot, the imminence of pathos, unconscious, in the logos makes art a disruption that inscribes the unthinkable in thought. An example is Schoenberg's music, Per Adorno, pushing capitalism to a new level of inhumanity, the first heteronomy, where the inhumanity then turns back on the work, disrupting its technical arrangement, the second heteronomy. However, double heteronomy is still inadequate in countering the spirit of forms, and the inner necessity of heteronomy in autonomy must give way to the notion of sheer heteronomy, 3BII. This is exemplified in Leotard's rereading of the Kantian sublime to see a gap that opens up between the sensible and the supersensible in the defeat of the imagination by the experience of an infinite. Sheer heteronomy is the defeat. This is a triumph over the spirit of forms in that the loss of a relation between the sensible and the intelligible is not the loss of the power of relating that could lead to de-aestheticization, but rather a multiplication of its forms. Modern art takes up addressing the gap in a way that Hegel's loss of truth and life, end of art, formulation cannot. Thus, modernity's destiny is not the end of art, and the promise of emancipation persists through the life of art's dynamic balancing of autonomy, heteronomy, oppositions, in shuttling between the extremes of art becoming life and art becoming art. In the multi-layered scenarios explained here, there is consistent appeal to overarching Ranciarian and overarching Ranciarian feature, the logic of the and. Ranciere's aesthetic experience is based in Schiller's originary logic of the and, where aesthetic experience includes both the art of the beautiful and the art of living. The same logic of the and predicts and delivers a different politics of aesthetics for each scenario. The and is present in the scenarios including both life-art separations and life-art fusions. Heteronomy and the autonomy-heteronomy relation are not taken up directly in art-life fusion scenarios, 1b, 2, and 3a, because the heteronomy is not a defining feature of the scenario. Thus, heteronomy, too, is subject to the logic of the and and since the scenarios include its presence and its absence, and different kinds of its presence, e.g. the double heteronomy and the sheer heteronomy. Ultimately, the politics of aesthetics is a multifaceted formulation that includes aesthetics politically rearranging its space, reconfiguring art as a political issue, and asserting itself as a true politics. Ranciere concludes that because each scenario has its own politics, 
there is an overall undecidability in the politics of aesthetics, and that art thrives in the ambiguity of being connected to politics, but unable to fulfill political promises directly. The politics produced in the scenarios are ones in which art variously refutes the hierarchical divisions of the perceptible, one, replaces politics as a configuration of the sensible, two, becomes the social hermeneutics of the collective unconscious, 3A, and becomes the guardian of the promise of emancipation, 3B. The politics are different at levels of enactment and detail like their heteronomy, autonomy relations, but similar in that art offers an explanation of the perceptible as a means of a larger, more political and empowered participation in life. A potential conflict arises in that equal validity seems to be given to each of the politics produced in the scenarios, while the essay's directional narrative of subsequent scenarios addressing previous inadequacies suggests the privileging of the last scenario. However, Ranciere's affinity for the logic of the and, the broad tone of delineating different aspects of politics and aesthetics, and the two principal scenarios, art becoming life and life becoming art, being self-contained indicates that this inconsistency should not be the conclusion. Instead, we should see Ranciere as having importantly opened up the space for considering the politics of aesthetics concept and its prospects. Thank you. Please join me next time.